Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, two announcements at the top, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, first, today we learned the very sad news that Mexican state and federal authorities recovered four U.S. citizens kidnapped on March 3rd in Matamoros, Mexico. Two U.S. citizens were returned to the United States. The bodies of two other U.S. citizens killed in the same incident were also recovered. We're providing all appropriate assistance to them and their families. We extend our deepest condolences to the family and loved ones of the deceased. We thank our Mexican and U.S. law enforcement partners for their efforts to find these innocent victims, and the task forward is to ensure that justice is done. Next, earlier today, at the launch of the 2023 Joint Response Plan for the Rohingya Humanitarian Crisis in Bangladesh, the United States announced nearly $26 million in additional, in additional humanitarian assistance for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and the region. Uh, for those people in Burma affected by ongoing violence, and for the communities hosting refugees from Burma. With this new funding, our total assistance for those affected by the Rakhine State and Rohingya crisis has reached nearly $2.1 billion since August of 2017, when over 740,000 Rohingya were forced to flee to safety in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. This new funding allows our humanitarian partners to continue providing life-saving assistance to affected communities on both sides of the Burma-Bangladesh border, including nearly 980,000 Rohingya refugees hosted by Bangladesh, some 70, 740,000 of whom arrived in the months following August 2017, when they were forced to flee genocide, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and other horrific atrocities and abuses perpetrated by Burma's military in Rakhine State. This funding will also provide assistance to nearly 540,000 Bangladeshi host community members and to others affected by ongoing violence in, Bang in, in Burma. The United States appreciates the generosity of the government of Bangladesh and other nations uh, and, and the hospitality of the Bangladeshi people in hosting Rohingya refugees, especially now that we are in the sixth year of this protracted crisis. We remain committed to working towards durable solutions to the crisis and will continue to partner with the government of Bangladesh, the Rohingya community, host communities, and people inside Burma to ensure a coordinated and well-supported response to this humanitarian crisis. The international community must remain steadfast in our commitment to alleviating the suffering of the world's most vulnerable people, including through uh, the Rohingya crisis response. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, can I just ask you to clarify or, or extrapolate a little bit on what you said about the Mexico. So you're saying that, yes, you have now been able to confirm that two of the four were killed? That's correct. And that the other and, and that the other two are now back in the U.S.? The, the, the two survivors? The two survivors uh, have since been repatriated back to the United States. Uh, that occurred with the assistance uh, of our Mexican partner, partners, with the assistance uh, of our officials uh, in Mexico. Uh, we are in the process of working to repatriate the remains uh, of the two Americans who were killed in this incident. Okay, so they, so the, the, those bodies are not, are not uh, back. In not the, yet. And and uh, underst I understand that the investigation is still early, but do you have any reason to believe that they were targeted? Matt, just as you said, the investigation is in its earliest days. Uh, I understand we uh, may have more to share from the FBI uh, at the appropriate time, but uh, from the Department of State, it's important for us not to impinge on investigative equities, uh, especially in an investigation like this that implicates uh, the kidnapping of four Americans, the death uh, of two Americans, uh, and two Americans who survived uh, what, by all accounts, uh, must have been a traumatic and harrowing experience. So we don't want to get ahead of that investigation. Uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Um, this is ongoing about Georgia. Have you been following the situation in Tbilisi, Georgia? Since morning, there were clashes between the protesters and the police, and there were clearly an excessive uh, use of military, I'm sorry, the um, law enforcement power. Um, and this is over the you know, Kremlin-inspired uh, legislation that we uh, talked extensively in the last few weeks. So what, <clears throat> what are you learning about that? We've been closely following developments in Georgia uh, in recent hours. We've seen the reports that are emanating from Tbilisi. We've seen reports that protesters have been met uh, with tear gas, uh, with other efforts to repress and suppress uh, the protest uh, against this draft so-called foreign agents legislation. Our message 
to the people of Georgia, to the government of Georgia, to people and governments around the world is that the United States stands with all of those who uh, are peacefully exercising what is a universal right. It is a universal right to people around the world uh, to assemble, uh, to have their voices heard, to speak uh, freely, uh, to hold their own governments accountable. Uh, we are going to continue to monitor the situation on the ground in Georgia, uh, but uh, our message is that peaceful protesters should be allowed to exercise that right peacefully. Uh, that is a right that is available to people in Georgia. It is a right that is available uh, to people in every country around the world. And very lastly, um, today's latest um, statement by the embassy uh, of the U.S. in Georgia starts with the sentence, today is a dark day for Georgia's democracy, and the entire text is the harshest that I've ever seen you know, throughout the 30-plus <clears throat> years of diplomatic relations. So just give me a general sense of uh, the, the, what is the feeling at the State Department between diplomats when they are looking at those you know, human rights records, rule of law, the freedom of speech, and detrimental effect it has towards uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. How much will the U.S. foreign policy and the you know, foreign aid and uh, all of that will change if that trajectory will be continued by the Georgian government, and which is moving the country towards Russia. You asked about the feeling here. The feeling here is one of deep concern. Uh, you have heard us express that sentiment consistently in recent days. It is a feeling of deep concern because of the potential implications of this draft law. Uh, this draft law would strike at some of the very rights that are central to the aspirations of the people of Georgia uh, for uh, a consolidated democracy, for Euro-Atlantic integration, uh, and for a brighter future. It would stigmatize and silence independent voices uh, and citizens of, citizens of Georgia who uh, wish to do nothing more than work together to build a brighter future, a future that uh, is integrated with Europe, a future that is democratic and free, uh, where Georgia is an independent and sovereign country. Uh, we are so deeply concerned and troubled, uh, of course, for what this could mean for the people of Georgia, uh, but also because the United States has been a partner to Georgia over the course uh, of recent decades, ever since Georgia declared its independence, the United States has been right there with it, supporting the aspirations of the Georgian people. And at the earliest days of Georgia's independence, those aspirations were nascent. They were nothing more than an idea in some cases. Over the course of ensuing decades, uh, the people of Georgia have worked to realize those aspirations. They have made tremendous progress in becoming the democracy that they sought from those earliest days, in integrating Georgia uh, into the Euro-Atlantic community and ensuring that Georgia stays on that path. Now, however, uh, we see a draft piece of legislation that would be a tremendous setback. Uh, this would be a setback to the aspirations of the people of Georgia. It would be a setback to the ability uh, of the United States to continue to be a partner for uh, the people of Georgia. Uh, I made this point yesterday, I, I think it was, but uh, anyone who is voting for this draft legislation uh, would be responsible in part for jeopardizing uh, those very Euro-Atlantic aspirations of the Georgian people. We don't wish to see that happen uh, beyond the United States. It is uh, the EU, the UN, of course, most importantly, the Georgian people, Georgian civil society groups, uh, all of them have issued uh, strong statements of concern uh, about this draft legislation. Yeah, Alex. I have to follow up on that. Uh, sure. Georgian government is looking at Hungarians and others and seeing that they did the exact same thing and they got away with it. Uh, when you say they're going to be responsible, is there any obvious example that demonstrates what you mean by that? And also, when it comes to Georgia's aspiration and integration towards the European institutions, has the Georgian Dream government crossed the line today? Alex, I think really the best example is the counterexample. Uh, it is the example of the type of partnership that the United States government can have uh, with people and countries that aspire uh, to continue down that path of democracy, of democratic reform, of integration, 
uh, with Europe and the broader Euro-Atlantic region. Uh, I think the best counterexample is the United States partnership with Georgia. Uh, if you want to look at what that partnership can look like, what that partnership uh, can feel like, and how, as we are concerned, that partnership uh, could be at least in part jeopardized uh, should a law like this move forward. Ultimately, uh, these are going to be uh, the decisions of uh, the Georgian people and the Georgian government. It is our strong hope that the Georgian government listens to the Georgian people. The Georgian people are speaking with a clear voice. Uh, right now, we're seeing some of those clear voices, those loud voices drowned out uh, by tear gas, by efforts to suppress uh, those that peaceful exercise uh, of freedom of assembly, that's of concern to us. But ultimately, we think it's important that governments around the world, including, of course, the government in Tbilisi, uh, listens to its people. And in terms of accountability, is there anything uh, that prevents the United States government from um, sanctioning the man behind all this uh, state, all this story, uh, Mr. Ivan Shvili, um, <clears throat> who, you know, whose party is obviously bringing up this, this sort of uh, uh, legislations and basically they are out there and trying to advocate for pro-Russian, let's say, uh, pathway. So Alex, I, as you know, I, I don't speak to specific individuals or entities who may be subject to uh, US or other sanctions. But uh, we have a number of tools uh, within uh, our purview that would allow us uh, to hold accountable anyone in any country around the world uh, who is responsible for the suppression of what would otherwise be a universal human right. Uh, there are authorities that are written into various laws, into executive orders, uh, that we will look at closely in this context, as we do in, in any context, uh, to hold to account uh, those who uh, may run afoul uh, of what the Georgian people want and, most importantly, what the Georgian people uh, expect and deserve uh, in terms of their universal rights. Yeah, Russia is slated to lead the UN Security Council uh, next month. Uh, is this something that the United States government is worried about, the world should be worried about? Well, Alex, uh, this is part of a, a rotation uh, of the members of the UN Security Council. Uh, if I recall, uh, Russia was president of the Security Council in February of 2022. And it was during a, a pretty notable uh, session of the Security Council that Russia uh, tried to bring together to uh, issue its own propaganda uh, to talk about what it termed uh, speciously uh, the violations of human rights in the Donbass region. Uh, but despite Russia's best efforts, the international community came together and exposed uh, what Russia was planning to do to uh, its neighbor on an unjust, illegal basis in the coming days. Secretary Blinken laid that out in that session in pretty exacting detail. Uh, other countries who were represented uh, at that round table in the UN Security Council chamber um, voiced similar concerns, grave concerns, uh, about what we highly suspected uh, Russia would be doing uh, in the coming days. So even if Russia and when Russia uh, again takes the helm of the Security Council, uh, there will be no amount of propaganda, of disinformation, of misinformation uh, that Russia can attempt to manufacture to drown out its lies uh, and to hide the truth uh, from those represented in this body and those around the world who are listening to it. Uh, Said. Thank you. Moving to the Palestinian issue. Uh, today, the Israeli army stormed the Janine refugee camp again. You know, left at least six dead, six Palestinians dead, 26 <coughs> wounded wreckage of uh, home destroyed and so on and I, i'm you know i'm wondering whether in the statement last night that was issued after meeting with uh, mr derma and mr hanigby uh, the, the secretary of state called on both sides for calm is that the kind of calm that you expect from the israelis your partners or is it or are you reconciled to the fact that this government this netanyahu government you know will take it out on the Palestinians to sort of export it is crisis at home. Said, a couple things on this. First, uh, we are aware of these reports. We understand uh, the IDF, which they have said publicly, was pursuing a terrorist uh, who murdered two Israeli civilians in what can only be described as a horrific attack late last month on, on February 26th. Israel, as we have made the point before, has 
the legitimate right to defend its people and its territory uh, against all forms of aggression, including, of course, those uh, from terrorist groups. And we've, as I just mentioned, have seen far too many vivid illustrations of the terrorist threat that Israel faces, including in recent days. Uh, we remain deeply concerned by the sharp rise in violence uh, in the West Bank, and we continue to urge the parties to take immediate steps to prevent the further loss of life, as you saw in the readout from the Secretary's discussion yesterday uh, with uh, Mr. Dermer and the National Security Advisor. Uh, that was a message that the Secretary reiterated in that context as well. Uh, we've said this many times before, but uh, we continue to believe that Israelis and Palestinians deserve equal measures uh, of freedom, of security, uh, of prosperity. That remains our goal. That remains our long-term goal to, uh, in the first instance, uh, keep alive the prospects of a negotiated two-state solution on the path to realizing that. Uh, the near-term goal is the goal we keep stressing in public and in private, uh, that Israelis and Palestinians must take steps on an urgent basis to de-escalate tensions, to restore calm, uh, and to put an end to this cycle of violence that has taken the lives of far too many on, on both sides. You know, uh, now this is really like Groundhog Day. I mean, you keep saying, Israel has a right to defend itself. Fine, Israel has a right <clears throat> to defend itself. Israel considers most Palestinians to be terrorists. Anyone that lifts a stone or, you know, protests in any way is considered in the Israeli power lines as, as a terrorist. You said day after day glorifying the Ukrainian people resistant to the, to the Russian occupation, which is great. What about the Palestinians? Do they have a right to resist this military occupation that has gone on for almost 60 years? Uh, Saeed, our goal, as I just said a moment ago, is to, in the first instance, keep alive the prospects of a negotiated two-state solution and ultimately to help realize uh, that negotiated two-state solution. The in-state that we seek, that successive American administrations have sought, that countries around the world seek, uh, is an independent state for the Palestinian people, where they can live with equal measures of security, of prosperity, of stability, uh, of freedom, democracy, uh, and importantly, of dignity. Now, uh, of course, that is not the reality we have today. And so much of our efforts, uh, in addition to attempting to support uh, a restoration of calm, which has been the focus of recent weeks, has been to preserve not only the viability of a negotiated two-state solution, but to preserve the horizon of hope, to preserve the horizon of opportunity for the Palestinian people. Uh, that was a task that was uh, complicated by our inheritance. What we found uh, when this administration came into office in January of 2021, but. Uh, we made it an early priority uh, to restore the relationship with the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people, and as part of those efforts, uh, to preserve uh, and reinforce that horizon of opportunity and hope uh, to provide the Palestinian people with the humanitarian support that they need, more than $900 million worth of humanitarian support to the Palestinian people, uh, to provide them uh, in what we hope are real and tangible ways uh, with an improvement, however incremental it might be, uh, in their quality of life. Now, of course, uh, no one is satisfied. We're not satisfied. We're going to continue uh, with that task ahead of us. Uh, but ultimately, uh, all of this is in service is in, a, uh, is in service of a negotiated two-state solution. And for sure, you know, this administration position and restoration and you standing there day after day fielding questions and so on is all appreciated. We see that. We see that the Palestinian issue is being, you know, at least uh, addressed. But, you know, for Enhawar, for instance, we just see the settlers doing exactly the same thing. Not, not necessarily with the same bloody outcome, but today. They're, they're there today. They're dancing with soldiers, blasting music, chasing Palestinians, as we speak here, celebrating pure. What measure should the United States take to make sure that these settlers do not go, you know, unpunished in their daily deeds? Well, first, Saeed, we've spoken out clearly on this. We have, con we have condemned all forms uh, of violence. Uh, we're aware of reports yesterday, uh, excuse me, we're aware of reports of another attack on Hawara by settlers yesterday, as you referred to, and that comes just one week after the completely unacceptable attacks and torching uh, of property in the same village. Uh, we're extremely concerned uh, by these events and the continuing violence uh, in Israel and the West Bank 
Uh, we very much appreciate the statements by Prime Minister Netanyahu, by President Herzog, uh, and others uh, in Israel uh, calling for a cessation of this vigilante violence. Accountability and justice should be pursued with equal rigor in all cases of extremist violence and equal resources dedicated to prevent such attacks and to bring those responsible uh, for them to justice. Uh, the events of, of recent days only underscore for us the fragil fr fragility of the situation in the West Bank and the urgent need uh, to increase cooperation to prevent further, further violence. Uh, we have expressed our concern for the well-being of the civilian population in Huara, uh, and as we've said repeatedly, uh, Israel, Israelis and Palestinians equally deserve uh, to live in safety and security. Yeah, I just want to add to this uh, very briefly. Um, that, uh, have you guys completed your review into the Israeli designation of the six Palestinian NGOs as uh, terrorist groups? Uh, Matt, look, these, these types of reviews are always going to be subject to okay. Yes, these are, yes, say, no, but, but yes, if you, if you, if you, have you, you finished? If you ask the question, allow me to... to well, I am answer. asking the question, but it, like, <clears throat> you can say yes or no and then explain, but uh, so let's the, not get the yes or no at the very end. The, these, a, these, types of in, these types of investigations, because investigation is not the right review, term, these types whatever. of reviews uh, are always subject to, to new information. Uh, if we are in receipt of additional information that... Uh, changes our approach, our decision making, our calculus on this. We, of course, will re review this uh, carefully and with a critical eye. What I can say is uh, what we've said consistently on this. We have not seen anything uh, that has led us to change our approach to uh, these NGOs. Of course, our approach was different from the one that uh, our European Union uh, allies had. We've never funded uh, or supported these groups, but uh, we have not seen anything that has been provided to us that would allow us to uh, take punitive uh, action against any of these groups, for example. Okay, which means that what? That, that there is, I mean, as I understand it, there was never any U.S. money going That's to right. any of these groups. That's so, right. so what does that mean, that you haven't changed your, well, you're not designating them like That's the correct. Israelis did? That's correct. Um, but, you're, but at the same time, are you also saying that pending some new information that the Israelis provide that you think that uh, that you think as you have before that the allegations against these groups are specious well I don't know that we've used that term what, what we've well, said that they're not that, that, that what, what, what we've said consistently is that uh, these types of actions against independent NGOs uh, need to be predicated on a very high bar. Okay, and when was the <clears throat> last time that you updated either the Israelis or the these Palestinian NGOs about the status of the review? When you we know? spoke to the NGOs themselves? Well, I don't know. I mean, when, you know, you're saying that you haven't changed it, but that it's subject to change depending on there being new information. When was the last time you informed the Israelis of this? Perhaps yesterday? We've had we've had regular discussions with our Israeli partners. Up in the front. conversation between we, Secretary we, Blinken and, we, and we issued and a readout. Blinken. We issued a readout of yeah, that. I know, and it didn't mention it. That's why and I'm asking this question. So, did it come up? I, I'm just not going to go beyond the readout. What I will say is that uh, Mr. Dermer and the National Security Advisor have uh, a remit uh, that is primarily regional security. Uh, of course, the Secretary did make the point uh, about the need to de-escalate tensions um, between Israelis and Palestinians, but. Uh, much of that conversation was focused on the challenges to security in the region. And, of course, at the top of that list is, is Iran. That was the focus of that conversation. Uh, yes? Uh, China? Sure. Um, have you uh, watched Chinese Foreign Minister Qing Gang's press conference yesterday? And <clears throat> what is your take on it? Well, uh, I um, did, of course, uh, see excerpts of it. I saw some of, ex some of the excerpts uh, printed in uh, state-run media. Look. Um, our approach to the PRC is always going to remain the same. Uh, it is an approach that is predicated uh, on uh, the strategy that the Secretary laid out in May of last year that we've spoken to uh, ever since. Uh, it boils down to invest, invest, align, compete. Investing in ourselves, aligning uh, with our allies and partners, uh, and a recognition that competition is at the heart of this relationship. Uh, we uh, hear a number of things from our PRC counterparts. Of course, uh, the PRC is going through its own uh, internal processes. 
uh, and I couldn't speak to the motivation for some of the statements we've heard uh, from uh, senior PRC leaders uh, over the course of the past several days. But what I can tell you, uh, and this is a message <laughs> intended for the American people, the Chinese people, people around the world, that the United States does not seek conflict. Uh, the United States uh, seeks uh, a relationship with the PRC that has a floor, that has guardrails, uh, and that ultimately is a relationship that uh, has measures in place to prevent competition from veering into conflict. That has been the core focus uh, of our engagement with the PRC since the earliest days of this administration, when Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan met with uh, their counterparts in Anchorage uh, to more recent meetings, the meeting between President Biden and Pre President Xi, recent engagements uh, between Secretary Blinken and Wang Yi. It has been about primarily, at its core, one thing and one thing only. Uh, responsibly managing this relationship uh, to see to it that competition can't veer uh, into anything uh, resembling conflict. Would Qingang's remarks in any way change your calculus or decision making towards China? Uh, again, our approach is uh, based on these extrinsic features. Uh, the need to invest in ourselves, which we've done, uh, the need to align uh, with allies and partners around the world, which we've done. We've done that uh, in Europe. Uh, you see that reflected in the G7 communique from 2021. You see that uh, reflected in uh, the NATO strategic concept that for the first time mentions the systemic challenge that the PRC uh, poses to the rest of the world. Uh, you see that in uh, the restoration and the revitalization of the uh, EU-China dialogue, an important mechanism that we have with our European Union. Uh, allies uh, as well. You've seen us take that same approach with partners in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, but also competition. Uh, and seeing to it that the United States is best positioned uh, to compete, uh, knowing that for us at least, competition is not a bad thing. Competition is a good thing. It is uh, what is uh, ingrained in us as Americans is something that is uh, healthy and uh, something that uh, we seek out on a constructive basis. Um, we ultimately, however, seek to ensure that that competition, which uh, we welcome, as long as it's fair, is number one fair, uh, and that it doesn't veer into that, into that realm of conflict. But actually, talking about the competition, he said in reality, the competition, this, um, your competition aims to contain and suppress China in all respects. Um, basically, he just accused the U United States only accept one result, which is the U.S. wins, China lose. Can you accept other results? Of course. This is not about containing any country around the world. This is not about containing China. This is not about suppressing China. This is not about holding China back. This is about upholding uh, the rules-based order, uh, the rules-based order that countries like China have signed on to, that they signed on to in the earliest days of uh, the UN system, uh, that uh, they have signed on to in the context in the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, that they signed on to in the context of uh, international law, and that countries like China also consistently point to. Uh, this is what we're seeking to uphold. It is not about holding back China. It's not about holding back any other country. Uh, we want to... Uh, have that constructive competition uh, that is fair, uh, that allows our two countries to um, coexist responsibly, uh, as we are confident uh, we can, and that has those checks in place to see to it the competition doesn't veer into that conflict. And lastly, um, he warned that if the United States is not going to take a break, you risk conflict with China. Are there any mechanisms left right now to prevent confrontation or, and, or conflict? Well, uh, first on that list is dialogue, is communication. Yeah, but almost all dialogues are suspended. Well, that's unfortunate, uh, and it's, it is not our wish, it's not our doing. Uh, I would, I would, I would also push back. Thank you for for preempting that, Matt. I would also push back on the idea that uh, almost all uh, con almost all communication is suspended. That's not the case, of course. Uh, we have an embassy in Beijing. Uh, the PRC has uh, an embassy here with a new ambassador. Uh, in fact, someone who is uh, well known uh, to senior American officials. Uh, Secretary Blinken just sat down uh, with uh, Wang Yi in Munich. 
There have been a number of engagements with uh, our PRC counterparts at various levels, uh, even in recent weeks when, admittedly, uh, tensions have been somewhat elevated. So first on that list is the ability to engage in dialogue, the ability to communicate clearly, directly uh, with one another. Now, there are areas where there isn't the level or the cadence of communication that we would like to see. Uh, and our colleagues at the Department of Defense have, have spoken to that. Again, uh, that is not our doing. Uh, that is because of the decisions that have been made in Beijing, not the decisions that have been made in Washington. So we would like to see these channels of communication continue uh, to expand and, at the appropriate time, uh, even deepen. Can I just follow uh, up on yeah. that specifically? Um, when you laid out the Biden administration's <clears throat> policy approach to China just there, you talked about investing in ourselves, aligning with partners and allies, and competing constructively. Mm -hmm. um, another major pillar that you guys have um, referenced in the past is working with China where interests align. Um, why did you leave that out today? Is there any reason for it? Or are you more pessimistic about working with China at this point in time? N not at all. Not at all. This is, uh, it, it is a, a, a key element uh, of our vision of the relationship. Uh, we know, and there are different ways to talk about the relationship, uh, the, the pillars that we talked about are the, the pillars that Secretary Blinken laid out uh, in May. But um, there are different features of this relationship. Uh, there are some features that uh, are competitive, and in fact, that's uh, most uh, features of this relationship, we think. Uh, there are some features that have the potential to be adversarial or even conflictual. Those are the areas that we want to um, uh, confine, narrow, uh, even potentially eliminate if we could. Uh, and there are some areas that we believe have to be cooperative and collaborative. Uh, not because it's a favor to the PRC or to any other country, but it's be because it's profoundly in our interest and in the interests of countries around the world. We've talked about uh, some of those such areas. Climate uh, is one. Uh, this is, with the world's two largest emitters, an area in which we have to uh, cooperate with one another. It's also an area where we have managed uh, to cooperate with one another now over successive uh, administrations. Uh, fentanyl and the, the challenge of synthetic drugs, uh, of course, is uh, another where we have to find ways to work together. Uh, we would like to do more with the PRC. Um, we are encouraging deeper cooperation uh, and collaboration on the part uh, of the PRC on a challenge that is, that is the leading killer uh, of Americans aged 18 to 49, uh, but that has wreaked havoc on countries near and far. All that to say, uh, there are transnational challenges, challenges that uh, have a disruptive effect on the lives of the American people, uh, but also on people uh, around the world where uh, the United States and China, we believe, uh, can and should uh, work together. And I'm sorry, I missed the top of the briefing. I saw your remarks, but I just have a few follow-up questions on the Americans kidnapped and murdered in Mexico. Um, you said that the two bodies of the Americans who were killed have been recovered. Do you have any information for us as to who within the U.S. government has those bodies right now? Is it FBI investigators? Is it State Department officials? And where exactly those bodies are in Mexico right now? I, I don't have uh, specific details to relay on where uh, those, uh, where their remains are. We are working collaboratively. Uh, our officials from our consulate in Matamoros, uh, our officials um, based in the embassy in, in Mexico City, uh, are working uh, very closely with their Mexican counterparts, with the FBI, with the DEA, uh, with other partners on this uh, in an effort to repatriate those, rema those remains as soon as we can. And just one more question, actually two, um, sorry. Uh, are, is the U.S. government satisfied at this point with your engagement with the Mexican government on this you know, crisis issue? And we've heard from yourself and from the White House that you guys are focused on ensuring that justice is done. Can you just explain for us what justice could actually look like? Well, first, case. when it comes to what we've seen from our Mexican partners, we, we do express our, our deepest appreciation uh, to our Mexican partners, uh, as well as to our interagency colleagues, uh, for their efforts in uh, facilitating uh, the recovery of these two Americans uh, and for uh, the recovery of the remains of the two Americans uh, who tragically 
uh, are, are now deceased. Uh, in terms of justice and accountability, uh, this is something that will be within the purview of our law enforcement colleagues. Of course, the FBI is engaged on this. Mexican authorities are engaged on this. It's not for me or for the State Department to be prescriptive, but ultimately uh, we want to see accountability uh, for the violence that has been inflicted on these Americans that tragically uh, led to the death of two of them. Uh, yes. Uh, Mexico, Sam, yeah, Mexico, sure. Do you think that the Mexican government is doing enough against drug cartels? And, and some Republicans are asking again to designate drug cartels as uh, terrorist groups. What, what's your position on that? Uh, so this is a challenge in parts of Mexico. Uh, it is a challenge that has spillover effects uh, for Americans and for the United States. Uh, it is a challenge uh, on which we are uh, partnering with our uh, Mexican counterparts. <clears throat> this is, um, of course, something that has the full attention of this administration. It is a uh, long-running uh, challenge, but uh, we are going to work cooperatively, collaboratively uh, with our Mexican partners in any way we can uh, to help address uh, these uh, pockets of insecurity, uh, the uh, drug trafficking, uh, the other security threats uh, that are um, at or near, sometimes uh, cross over uh, into our border. Uh, when it comes to the drug cartels, uh, we are going to do what is most effective uh, to limit their ability to traffic uh, in their wares. Uh, this is something that our colleagues at the DAA are uh, extremely focused on. We have laws on the books. Uh, we have designated uh, these uh, criminal organizations, these drug trafficking organizations, consistent with uh, the authorities uh, that we as a government have, but uh, we are always going to look at every tool that is uh, by law or any other authority uh, available to us uh, to attempt to work with our Mexican partners uh, to crack down on what is a threat to Mexicans and to Americans alike. So you, you, you are open to consider them like uh, group terrorist groups? Uh, we, have, we have designated these groups as appropriate. Um, we are always going to continue to do what is most effective and what is available to us uh, to hold these groups accountable. Uh, Ukraine? Thank you, Matt. Um, you know, uh, even after one year of the war, even <clears throat> seeing all these atrocities, uh, Ukrainians are really shocked now because of the footage emerged. And it's a footage of the Ukrainian sol soldier reportedly uh, captured by Russian in Bakhmut and uh, shot by death, standing unarmed and just uh, saying uh, glory to Ukraine. Two questions, please. Firstly, uh, could you comment on this if the State Department is aware of this footage and this reportages? And secondly, may one expect that uh, the international team and American team who is helping Ukraine to investigate the military crime can help with this because the country started its own investigation right now? Thank you. Uh, so of course we are aware of this gruesome video. There is no other word for it. Um, the harrowing imagery of this unarmed Ukrainian uh, being executed uh, after making the simple statement of glory to Ukraine uh, is just breathtaking uh, in terms of its uh, barbarity. Uh, Russia, we believe, should be ashamed of itself. It is flouting the basic rules of war, basic humanity, uh, basic decency when it's, when it's forces uh, take part in atrocities like this. Members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, in Ukraine. We're not naive uh, to believe that Russia will admit to this or in the near term even uh, change its ways. This of course is not the first evidence of Russia's apparent atrocities in Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, it probably will not be the last. A tally that our Ukrainian partners uh, our maintaining of uh, potential uh, war crimes or atrocities now has tens of thousands of instances on it. Uh, Russia has repeatedly says that it wants peace. Um, there can be peace in Ukraine today. There could have been peace in Ukraine a year ago. Uh, Russia, if it is serious about that, can withdraw its forces from Ukraine. Uh, Russia's leaders uh, in the Kremlin, as they see uh, these harrowing images, uh, should remember that the international community, including the United States, uh, will do everything we possibly can uh, to see to it that those responsible at uh, the ground level 
up to the political level, uh, are held responsible and accountable uh, for these war crimes and atrocities that we've seen committed. Let me, let me move around just so we can. Quick follow up on this point. You're saying that Russia could end this war today. So, but they need to withdraw. Is that, is that, is that a precondition to start any negotiations? Uh, Saeed, President Zelensky has put forward a vision for a just and durable peace. Uh, just peace means a peace that is consistent uh, with the basic foundational principles that countries around the world, including Russia, have si signed up to. The UN Charter, international law, universal declaration of human rights, basic principles like territorial integrity, sovereignty, independence, everything uh, that is at stake in Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. And durable, uh, meaning that uh, there can't be a phony peace in which Russia stops fighting only to rest, to refit, to regroup, uh, and to reattack, whether that's within months or years down the road. Uh, this is a vision that, sec that uh, President Zelensky has put forward. It's a vi vision we believe in that countries around the world have endorsed as well. Uh, yes. Uh, John Zebeli from Airway News. Uh, the current government of Pakistan suspended the transmission <clears> and <throat> license of Airway News in all over the country. And this is not the first time Airway News is being targeted. We spoke about it many times. Even Consul Derek Shole told me that he's going to take up this issue uh, with the Pakistani government when he was visiting Pakistan. Your thoughts and your comments on that, please. Well, this is an issue that we routinely raise. We routinely raise our concerns about press freedom to stakeholders around the world, including to uh, counterparts and partners in Pakistan. Uh, a free press and informed citizenry are key to uh, any nation and its democratic future. Uh, as a general matter, we're concerned uh, by media and content restrictions that undermine the exercise of freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, and association. So it's, uh, this, the same government of Pakistan uh, who suspended the license of airway news also banned women's march. Uh, they are not giving permission to the women to mark International Day uh, for some reason. And the interesting thing is that the foreign minister of Pakistan is giving lecture in UN right now on women's leadership and uh, rights of women. Anyways, um, what are your thoughts on <coughs> giving permission for the women to express themselves on the International Women's Day? Well, the narrow question you raise is not a question for the United States. The narrow question you raise, as I understand it, pertains to uh, a decision that was put down by municipal authorities in Lahore. Uh, and ultimately, we would defer to municipal authorities for the narrow question. On the broader question, uh, we know, the United States knows, that by strengthening gender equity and equality, uh, countries around the world strengthen their stability, uh, prosperity, their security, uh, and their democracy. So the United States government announced 500 scholarship uh, for the uh, for the 500 flood affected students in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, can you share some details about? Uh, that? So we did announce 500 new scholarships for Pakistani university students from these flood affected districts. These scholarships will assist the students in completing their degrees. Uh, our ambassador to Pakistan, uh, to Pakistan uh, Donald Bloom, announced the scholarships today as part of an International Women's Day celebration at the Higher Education Commission in Islamabad. Uh, the United States, through the department, through USAID has supported scholarships for meritorious yet financially disadvantaged students uh, to pursue higher education at top Pakistani universities. Uh, in partnership with the Higher Education Commission, uh, the U.S. government has awarded over 6,000 scholarships through the Merit and Needs-Based Scholarship Program, and 60 percent uh, of those scholarships have been awarded to women uh, as part of our support for women's higher education, and that goes back uh, to the point I made earlier about uh, women's equity and equality. Yes. I just would like to follow up on yesterday's meeting between Secretary Blinken and uh, South Korean National Security Advisor <clears throat> Kim Sun-ha. Can you talk a bit about the outcome of the meeting? Is they also exchange their views about ROK's new announcement on historic coal issue with Japan and uh, coming ROK's present visit to the United States? Uh, yes. So the answer to uh, your questions is yes. Uh, it was a very productive uh, meeting that the Secretary had uh, with ROK NSA Kim, Kim Sung Han yesterday. Uh, we issued uh, a readout after that meeting, but uh, as we said, the Secretary heartily welcomed uh, the announcement that bilateral discussions between the ROK and Japan uh, to resolve sensitive historical issues uh, had concluded. Uh, in addition, the Secretary and the National Security Advisor discussed how both countries can further support 
uh, can further offer our support to Ukraine and to boost uh, our collective economic security. Uh, and the Secretary assured uh, the National Security Advisor of the United States ironclad uh, commitment to the defense of the ROK. Uh, and they also noted uh, how much they look forward to uh, the state visit that was announced by the White House today uh, of President Yoon uh, to the White House in April. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, sometimes, oh Matt. God, what, how shocking. I, I, it's hard to imagine, I know. Yes, go ahead. To follow up on the ROK president visit to White House, mm -hmm. um, what kind of topics do you expect during the state visit, including security, security issues in East Asia and economic security? And also, do you hope this state visit will also contribute to deeper trilateral cooperation, including Japan? Sure. This, of course, will be the second state visit of this administration. And I note that because um, for us, it's important that our ROK allies uh, were to uh, have that spot of honor. Uh, the upcoming visit celebrates the 70th anniversary of the U.S. ROK alliance. Uh, it's critical, we believe, to advancing peace, stability, and prosperity for our two countries, for the broader Indo-Pacific region, uh, and for the broader world. Uh, the two presidents will highlight the importance and enduring strength of the iron, uh, ironclad U.S. ROK alliance, as well as the United States' unwavering uh, commitment to the ROK. Uh, they will also discuss our shared resolve to deepen and broaden our political, economic, security, and people-to-people -people ties. Obviously, that is um, a broad set uh, of topics, but uh, the state visit uh, is uh, now about a month away. Uh, I imagine we'll have uh, more specific details to share uh, as we approach that visit. Yes. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. It's about uh, girls' trip to Tehran. You mentioned um, very briefly yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> but have you seen the corrections done by Islamic Republic on girls' verbal report during his presser? Because they are basically denying many of um, agreements that girls talked about, for instance, increased monitoring or having access to some people or some uh, suspected sites. Also, Gerosi said that some cameras are going to start working again, the cameras that Islamic Republic took down um, in June. Uh, have you seen those corrections and where do you stand on that? Because you decided um, that during the Board of Governors ongoing session to take no actions against Islamic Republic. So how do you interpret these contradictions <coughs> between what Grossi is saying and what Islamic Republic is claiming? So the second part of your question, uh, we're closely coordinating with our European allies, the so-called E3 uh, allies that are uh, part of the uh, P5 plus one, following uh, Director General Grossi's discussions in Tehran this past weekend. Uh, but we don't have uh, anything to preview when it comes to uh, our posture at the, at the Board of Governors uh, that will unfold uh, in the coming hours. Uh, we'll continue to support the IAEA in its efforts to clarify and resolve all outstanding safeguards issues and apply effective verification and monitoring measures at Iran's nuclear facilities. And we call on Iran to fully comply with its legally binding obligations under its comprehensive safeguards uh, agreement with uh, the IAEA. Now, the key point for us uh, is that the joint statement between the IAEA and Iran was important. Uh, what will be much more important is the follow through. Uh, and we have full faith and confidence on the part of the IAEA uh, to monitor uh, Iran's follow through or lack thereof, uh, as the case might be. We will judge Iran on its actions, nothing less. Um, and we expect, as does the IAEA, uh, Iran to follow through with the commitments that it made in line with that joint statement. And do you think anything regarding Iran's nuclear program is going to happen uh, from U.S. sides before the 2024 presidential election? Are you going to take any action before the, the election? Uh, I just wouldn't want to uh, speculate uh, on that. Uh, look, we have a number of concerns with Iran. Uh, we've repeatedly made the point that uh, we are conveying very clearly uh, to the Iranians uh, three messages. First, stop killing, stop suppressing your people. Second, stop providing UAV technology uh, to Russia. And third, uh, release the wrongfully detained Americans that you have held. Now, of course, when it comes to Iran's nuclear program, that is uh, a threat. It is a challenge to the United States. 
It is a threat and a challenge to uh, our partners in the region. In some ways, it's a threat and challenge to countries around the world. Uh, we continue to believe that only through diplomacy uh, will we be able to address the challenge that Iran's nuclear program poses. Only will we be able to address it in a way that is permanent, is durable, uh, and is verifiable. Our focus when it comes to Iran's nuclear program remains on diplomacy. Diplomacy is always going to be our first resort, uh, but that is not to say that uh, it would be our last resort. We haven't taken any options off the table. We're very focused on this. Right now, we're working with allies, partners around the world uh, on the most effective ways uh, to counter uh, Iran's nuclear program that, of course, is concerned to us. Yes? Uh, still in Iran, sure. Um, report, uh, there were reportedly cross-border missile attacks uh, from Iran into Iraq today. Um, <clears throat> Defense Secretary Austin is there, so is the German Foreign Minister. Do you think, um, given what you just said, your messages to Iran and the fact that the U.S. and its allies have been talking, um, speaking out in support of the Iranian people, uh, that this missile attack may be a message? Uh, Gita, I, I had seen those reports um, as of an hour or so ago. We weren't in a position to confirm those reports, so I can't speak to the veracity uh, of, of the information you just relayed. Uh, what I can say, however, is that we have seen Iran undertake uh, challenges, threats, provocations uh, with the objective of uh, intimidating or uh, violating the sovereignty of Iraq. Uh, we stand by our Iraqi partners. We stand by uh, Iraq's sovereignty uh, in any efforts to strike out uh, at Iraq's sovereignty, its independence, uh, that is uh, something that uh, we condemn uh, forcefully. But we're just not in a position to confirm those reports just yet. Sure. Um, so with their warships landing in Brazil last week, uh, does State Department or White House have any comment for the Brazilian government specifically? And do you guys view this sort of like, you know, through a kind of Monroe Doctrine lens of like, they're on our, you know, body of land? Countries are going to make their own decisions. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine is um, a legacy of history. Uh, it is not something that uh, the United States uh, espouses. Uh, we have partners in our hemisphere. Brazil, of course, is a close partner of the United States. It's a close democratic partner of the United States. It's our impression. Uh, that no democracy in this hemisphere or anywhere else uh, would want these kinds of Iranian assets, these warships, docking in their ports. Uh, we want to continue to work with our Brazilian partners to send the right message uh, to Iran, to uh, others who would uh, pose a threat, pose a challenge, uh, to our collective interests uh, around the world. We believe, as we said, that warships like this have no place uh, in the Western Hemisphere, given the signal it sends. And if I could just get one sure. quick on Ukraine that wasn't mentioned. Sure. Um, Zelensky has vowed to retake Crimea, where Russian civilians have lived for almost a decade now. Um, and, and he said he's going to launch the spring offensive <clears throat> when Western tanks arrive, um, or someone in, in Ukraine advisor has. Um, are you guys concerned about Western weapons being used against Russian civilians in Crimea? A couple points. First, and most importantly, Crimea is Ukraine. That has been the position of the United States and the vast majority of uh, the global community since 2014. Only a small handful uh, of countries have offered uh, anything to the contrary. Crimea is Ukraine. It will be Ukraine going forward. That will not change. When it comes to the decisions that President Zelensky and his government will make, there's, those, those are their decisions. Uh, we are supporting Ukraine, our partners in Ukraine, to take on the battle where it is raging. Right now, it's raging in the east. It's raging in the south. We're providing our Ukrainian partners with what they need to uh, defend themselves, to defend their territory, to defend their democracy, uh, and ultimately to be effective uh, in the battle where it is at the moment. But if it were to attack, if civilians were to take casualties, what would what would the U.S. position, you know? Uh, again, that's a, a hypothetical. Uh, Ukraine is going to make its own decisions. It, it will uh, define what it seeks to accomplish. Uh, but we are supporting Ukraine as it is uh, taking on Russian invaders uh, where the battle is raging right now. That's in the south, that's in the east. Yeah, sorry, can I just go back mm -hmm. to the Brazil question mm -hmm. for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, the Brazil-Iran question. 
Um, that is, uh, uh, is the administration going to impose sanctions on um, uh, on the Brazilian port, uh, the port of Rio de Janeiro, and um, any any you know reef, you know gas? I don't know what they take, diesel, whatever it is. Uh, you know any any uh, vendors that um, that supplied them with uh, fuel or food or other supplies? Matt, you won't be surprised to hear that we don't preview those types of actions. But Brazil, of course, is a partner. Yeah. Uh, Brazil is aware. A... <clears throat> Have you made them aware that they are subject to secondary sanctions, given the fact that these two warships are designated? We are we are a partner to Brazil. Brazil is a partner have to us. Told. We we have discussions with our Brazilian partners on a range of issues. Uh, they, I am confident, uh, are aware of uh, existing sanctions uh, authorities. Is it, but... is it not U.S. law that they must be sanctioned? Matt, uh, again, we just uh, don't. There, we... there must be. Uh, is it not the the law that they that that you? This is a violation of, of, of those sanctions. I, I would, so I would, it, I would have to look it, into the law. the law. That... I would have to look into whether these are mandatory uh, and what the details are. But again, uh, our Brazilian partners are sanctions. Our, our Brazilian partners are partners. Uh, we are going to do what is most effective uh, together in pushing back on uh, the threat well, what, and what the challenge what, that Iran poses. Does that to... mean that you could decide that what is most effective is not implementing the law? Matt, you know we follow the law. Uh, again. I am I'm not I going to, know. I'm not, to be, I'm not going not, to if if it were found that the Brazilian the Brazilian port operator and attendant companies caterers fuel suppliers whoever you know provided this provided these two ships sanctioned ships with uh, with assistance with support um, would the sanctions apply as we always do we marry the facts with the law and arrive at a decision, but we don't okay, so, preview so answer, those so, so, decisions. All right, so the answer is yes. If you do determine that the, that the sanctions were violated, then there will be penalties imposed on your partners, quote unquote, in Brazil, at the Port of Rio and, and, and whoever else. Matt, I think you're uh, zooming a, a bit far ahead. We marry the facts with the law. Uh, we don't preview any actions we might take, uh, but importantly, uh, Brazil okay. is a partner, you, and we're having can, we're having these conversations with our Brazilian partners. That, but you can say that you will uphold the law. Matt, we follow the All law. Right. And then, and then, uh, just secondly, on your your Monroe Doctrine comment, you know, it was back in 2014 or so that Secretary Kerry declared that the Monroe Doctrine was dead. So that's not particularly new. But uh, in fact, yeah, I didn't intend to make news with that. Well, I know, but. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that it, it, it doesn't really appear to be dead. I mean, you guys say that it isn't dead, but uh, if you're going to go ahead and enforce the law uh, when it comes to Brazil and these Iranian uh, warships, that uh, would seem to suggest. Now, granted, Iran is not Europe, um, but uh, it, it it would seem to suggest that you are um, uh, opposed to and will take action against foreign non-Western Hemisphere interference in the Western Hemisphere. Which you're, you're, making, you're, you're making, you're Matt, you're making a number of assumptions. Uh, what, 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 is, what, 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 what is true, what is true, and that you are not wrong in, in relaying, is the fact that uh, a country like Iran poses a collective threat uh, to the United States and to our partners in this hemisphere. Uh, it is our intention to work collaboratively with our partners in the region, but even closer okay. to this neighborhood on, on those types okay. of threats. Well, I mean, do you believe that China poses a threat in the, in the Western Hemisphere, in, in places like Panama and Central America and places where they're making inroads? These are decisions yeah. that governments are going to have to make on a sovereign basis. Uh, our intention and engagement with these governments is to see to it, to do everything we can, uh, that their decisions are informed decisions. These are not decisions for us to make. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I had a question concerning uh, Okinawa Governor uh, Tamaki's visit to the State Department today. Um, before the visit, uh, Governor Tamaki has said that there is an overburden on the Okinawan residents due to the U.S. military presence there in the island. He's been calling for the relocation plan of the U.S. base in Okinawa to, to be reviewed so it is located outside of Okinawa. Um, could you tell me if any of these issues were discussed today during today's visit, and how does the State Department address these concerns and claims? I, uh, we'll, we'll see if we have anything to offer in the aftermath of the, the discussion today, see so if we can get you some, some details of that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, 
and I have a question. So, America may ban for the TikTok, and then are there any discussion with the Chinese side about this? And I'm just wondering, uh, what is the current assignment for Chinese devices? What is our current uh, assi assessment for Chinese devices? Uh, well, we don't paint with a broad brush, but I think you've heard my colleagues from the White House uh, and from other uh, partners across the government express the concern uh, that we have for technologies like TikTok, technologies that we recognize uh, that foreign governments could use to uh, pose a threat to the privacy, the personal security to American citizens, or uh, to pose a more systemic threat uh, to the United States and our interests. These are uh, challenges that we're attuned to, but ultimately this is a matter that is under review by the relevant authorities in this country, and we're not going to get ahead of that review. Thank Dylan? You. Yeah, I think you said yesterday that it would ultimately be up to uh, Speaker McCarthy to decide mm -hmm. what he's going to do as far as traveling to Taiwan or not. Um, part of the reporting that uh, covered that also <coughs> said that there was concern on both sides, including in the administration, uh, about China's reaction to such a visit. Um, it, can you speak to that? Is that true? Is there concern within the department, within the administration, uh, about how China would react to that visit if it happened? Uh, Dylan, uh, Congress is an independent, uh, co-equal branch of government. The Speaker, any member of Congress, is going to make his or her own decision. Uh, about the meetings that they take or choose not to take or how they take those meetings or where they take those uh, meetings. Uh, we routinely uh, engage with, uh, with members to share information that uh, we have. Look, our, our broader concern, uh, leaving aside uh, the uh, reports that have been out there about uh, Speaker McCarthy and a potential um, engagement, is the fact that the PRC has consistently sought to undermine uh, the prevailing status quo, the status quo that has upheld decades of peace and stability uh, across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, we saw the PRC in the aftermath of Speaker's Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan uh, attempt falsely to claim that her visit was a change to the status quo and to use that as a pretext. Uh, to undermine uh, the prevailing status quo. Our charge and our goal, unlike that of the PRC, is not to undermine the status quo, it is to reinforce. It is to strengthen uh, the status quo because we recognize that the status quo across the Taiwan Strait has undergirded peace and security. It's enabled uh, commerce. Uh, it has uh, contributed to the vision we share with so many of our partners of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, we are concerned that the PRC and its deeds, its words, uh, has sought to undermine that, uh, and that's something that we're continuing to watch very closely. So in the conversations you may have had with McCarthy's office, has there been increased concern expressed versus, for instance, Pelosi's visit, since you mentioned that? I'm just not going to comment on any uh, conversations we may have had with the Speaker in, in his office. Uh, I'm not aware that uh, Speaker McCarthy has announced any intention to uh, engage in a meeting. I'm not aware that uh, Taiwanese um, officials have uh, announced any forthcoming travel. Of course, those decisions uh, are going to rest with uh, the Speaker, and we'd refer you to his office in the first instance. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Senator Blinken has just met with uh, business leaders and members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I know that it was simultaneous with this press briefing, but is there anything else that you can update us on? Uh, we may have some additional details to relay in the aftermath, uh, in the aftermath of that engagement today. In written statement or by how? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll convey it how we're able to. I think we may have some, some written material to pass. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I have a question about sure. the report today about the blast on, on the North Stream pipelines. Mm -hmm. So did side reported that the investigators uh, established the vessel that was allegedly used to blow up the North Stream, mm -hmm. and it it belongs to two Ukrainian nationals from Poland. So should the investigators conclude that the Ukrainian government was actually behind the the blasts? Well, you will, reference will it, the will it somehow affect their relationship 
between the U.S. and Ukraine. You, you reference the investigators, and in fact, there are three countries yep. that are investigating uh, exactly what transpired. Our German allies, uh, our uh, Swedish and, and, and Danish uh, partners as well. They've opened investigation into uh, into what has happened. Uh, they uh, those investigations are ongoing, uh, as we always do. We're going to let those investigations play out uh, before we comment. Um, on any uh, potential findings or conclusions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on you know, yesterday's result on uh, the Russian uh, diamonds, uh, there was an engagement in this building, I think, with uh, industry uh, professionals mm -hmm. ahead of the uh, President uh, von der Leyen's uh, trip to Washington, D.C. Is there anything, uh, speaking like from broader picture, anything we should expect on this front in the coming days? Uh, when it comes to Russian diamonds? How to respond to, uh, along with your European uh, <coughs> colleagues. Uh, Alex, all I can say, and again, because we don't preview any actions that we may or may not take, we're always looking at steps we can take to deprive the Russian Federation of revenue that it would otherwise use uh, to prosecute this brutal war uh, against the people of Ukraine. Uh, we have taken steps when it comes to Russian oil, when it comes to Russian energy, when it comes to Russian gold, uh, a number of other assets that Russia would seek to leverage to fill its coffers, uh, and that in turn would be fungible uh, as Russia seeks to, to fund this war. But uh, I don't have anything to preview at this time. Shannon, I, said, but uh, the I, I need to. I need to move. We've already yeah. going back to Nord Stream. Sure. Can you just say, does the United States intend to eventually? make a conclusion of its own based off the variety of investigations, will it back those findings or not? These are close partners of ours who are uh, investigating uh, the blasts. Uh, we have full faith and confidence in the investigation that they're running. Uh, of course, we're going to wait for those investigations to conclude. Uh, we'll see what they say. But uh, again, we have full faith and confidence uh, in our European partners who are behind this. Thank you. Thank you.